We're back now with Rick Reeder of BlackRock, and we talk about what Rick is calling potentially a generational inflection point for fixed income. So what is that generational inflection point? You know, I mean, I, I've, I've said this before, I'm, I'm, I've never been more excited coming into a year of 23. First of all, 22 wasn't a lot of fun in a lot of the markets, but now, when you put in perspective where we are, for the last 10 years, the, the, the short end of the yield curve, the one to three year portion of the aggregate index, uh, the benchmark for fixed income, the average, average yield was 1.10%, 1.18%. The last three years is 1.10%. We're talking about four and a half now. Mm. So you've got an opportunity where you can, in fixed income, you can buy yielding assets and you don't have to, to stress around illiquid, really deep down in leverage loans, really deep down in parts of emerging markets. You can build a portfolio, investment grade credit, some of the AAA parts of uh, credit card finance, uh, student loan finance, et cetera, and you can create six to six and a half. That is, we haven't seen that, gosh, it's been, I don't know, I don't, God, since the 80s, 90s, that you've seen those sort of yields by buying quality assets. David, that is a critical moment without taking a lot of interest rate risk, without taking a lot of beta risk, without taking a lot of convexity risk. And you think about what does that mean for equities? What does that mean for private equity? If you can get six-ish, in high quality assets, even a bit higher than that, it means, boy, you've got to get higher numbers, significantly higher to take liquidity risk, volatility risk, et cetera. It's a really big deal. Money's going to flow into fixed income as a result of it. I want to come back to equity and private equity. Before that, duration. Uh, is there a particular duration you're looking at that's more attractive? Yeah, I mean, I, so, you know, it, it, the, you know, obviously with the inversion of the yield curve, it's been, you can capture, and this is part of the beauty of it, you don't have to take a lot of interest rate risk. I mean, so many times in my career, You've got to you know, hold, go out to the 10-year part or the 30-year part to get your yield. The curve's inverted. You can stay in the front end if you believe, which I think is right, the Fed is going to pause. Um, you get to a place where, gosh, I'm just going to try and clip that yield. What we've been doing, and I think we've been on, talking about this show, that we've started, stayed short. We've run a lot of cash this year. Cash has been our best performing asset at a lot of, you think about the financial markets. Now we can go a little bit longer. Can you go out to three years, five years? because the next evolution of the Fed will be easing. Again, I don't think it's till 23, 20, or till 24, 25, but if I can lock in these yields, go a little bit longer without having to go out to 10s or 30s, that to me is the sweet spot today. Rick, you mentioned uh, corporate investment grade, you mentioned possibly high grade uh, credit card. What about sovereigns? So, you know, we've added a little bit of emerging markets recently. I think one of the big things that we didn't touch on last year was the dollar. Massive appreciation dollar, Fed's moving, Fed's moving aggressively, money's flowing into the dollar, and not just, not just in fund flows, but in terms of corporate spend, et cetera. I think the dollar is going to be more stable. I'm not, I'm not ready to say the dollar is going to weaken significantly, but I think we're on the backside of real volatility. So parts of the emerging markets, Mexico, Brazil, Indonesia, you're getting some nice yield. And so I think you need to diversify it a bit more than historically because there's been stresses and it's still, we're not out of the woods, we're in a slowing economy. So do you hold some emerging market sovereign debt? Um, I think you can more so today, but gosh, I, I, I sleep really well at night knowing if I could buy 6% yielding assets that are high quality, investment grade, AAA securitized, uh, you know, how much EM do I really need? So we've been buying some, but not, not that aggressively. Well, and to follow on that, how, how much equity do you need? How much private equity do you really need? Because you were referring to that earlier. When you get those kinds of yields out of fixed income, it makes it awful hard to justify equity. So, I mean, I, you know, I always value equities based off of, obviously, what the earnings growth is going to be. But I also need to know what my alternative asset suite is. And companies borrow. And if they can't borrow at an attractive rate, it's hard to do M&A, CapEx. Uh, buy back their stock. And today, it's really hard. I mean, where borrowing rates are. So as an investor, it's symmetric. I'd rather just own that yield. Listen, if I have a long term and anybody's portfolio, you're going to have equities. You know, you're not looking at things for the next three months, six months, nine months. You need to have equities longer term. But if you said to me the marginal dollar, you know, people talk about 60, 40. The marginal dollar shouldn't be 60, 40. The marginal dollar in this environment should be much more heavily weighted. But let's get that yield in. And then the hurdle rate that I pay for illiquidity, if I got to lock up an asset for 10 years, and if I can just clip six, six and a half in a stable way, boy, you got to lift that hurdle rate to the mid-teens to really want to take that risk. And so I think that's working its way through the system today. But those rates also put pressure on equities and also private equity in two other ways, don't they? And number one, discount rate uh, applied to equities, which makes it less valuable, all the things being equal. And private equity, as they go out and they're trying to borrow money to make deals, it gets a lot more expensive than it has been in the past. 
So people underestimate that is a really, really big deal. It's your rollover financing that is usually, and, and so many assets that go into private equity, they get geared effectively. You think about the most acute form of that is anything attached to real estate. Commercial real estate being the most acute form thereof, but resi, residential as well. That's where you're, you're, it's built on gearing. And this is one of the things that I've always argued the Fed has to be very careful about how aggressively you move it up because that gearing that doesn't sit in the banking system the way it used to sits in the broad economy. And when you ratchet up, and you've seen it in the last couple of weeks, some of that stuff starting to break a bit. And that's why the Fed has to be sensitive to what is outside the, the banking system. And you may not even know what it is because you're not necessarily marketing to market the same way you do in a public market. That's right. Until you, until you have to roll over your yeah. financing. And, and uh, roll over your financing and or put, if you're in a project, how much more CapEx am I going to put into a project? How much more refurbishing of the building am I going to do if I'm not fully leased up? Those things are starting to make, make it, you know, when, you, when the economy was doing extremely well, rates were low, you know that lease rates were going to expand, but now when you're going the other way, really, really tough.